is up, everybody? What's going on? Come on. Hurt them more. <laughs> first of the year, close to first of the year. How's everybody doing on their uh, New Year's resolutions, their goals? Where's everybody at? I missed no resolutions. No resolutions? <laughs> okay, so I'm Steve Valentine. Um, some of you know who I am. Some of you follow me on social. Um, a little bit of my background, 20 years in the business. The business has changed a lot in the last 20 years. We've had a lot of different market shifts, a lot of different things. One of the things I want to lead you through this morning is a couple of different things. One, I am most inspired when I play racquetball in the mornings, and this morning I have a few things that I wanted to add in today. So um, I want to share with you a couple of things that are really important no matter where you're at in the business, where you're at in life, and some of the things that in life that are going to impact the business. And they're things that, um, 2008, um, actually it was 2007, way back up a little bit. 2007, my wife and I were foreclosed on, we lost everything. Stuck with a million dollars worth of debt and a million dollars worth of cash and assets, toast. Um, I was 27 at the time. Um, it was a it was a battle. Everything was there. Everything was, um, I wrote suicide notes. I mean, all of that in that time frame. And the reason I tell you that is because today I want to share something with you that kind of came to mind that I think is important going into the new year and some new things and some things that I've been a part of in the last year that I think will impact the way you do business and do life other than the way other things have been taught. So it's kind of a different way to look at it. Um, in 2008, I had the choice when I was, which was awesome, I was nominated for broker agent of the month back when they did the magazines. Uh, for those of you that have been in the business that long, I had a choice at that time to either try to stay rock star status to keep up with my ego or to share my story in order to inspire others that things will get better. And at that time, I shared all the losses. I went from being on a team with my parents, uh, selling 700 transactions the year before, to being completely broke without a house and two toddlers. The reason I did that was because of inspiration. So this morning, I wanna share a few things with you that are a little personal, that are journey that I'm starting to share, and I believe that it's, uh, it's extremely impactful, and it has to do with your mindset. Everything in this business has to do with what you're willing to do and what you're willing to focus on rather than the things that are not measurable. What's up? Hi there, how's it going? Good, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> it's so important that we find some things that are measurable and that we focus on the right things rather than the wrong things. So, um, and don't worry when I show you these pictures, I'm not gonna show us sell you any um, health products or anything, but I want to explain to you something that's really, really important because in real estate, we chase squirrels. The next shiny object, the next best lead generation thing, the next next best, right? I've built my business the last 20 years on relationships. If somebody actually looked at my business and the volume that we do and what I do, you'd realize that it has nothing to do with lead generation. There's a lot of people that are really good at that. I'm really good at person to person, business to business, and having those relationships without doing a lot of marketing and going through that process. So that, that is the way we built our business. We closed annually about 30 million a year um, with one agent and it's all done through relationships, not done through big marketing plans, those types of things. So I wanna share something with you. In fact, I'm gonna read this first. Again, super personal, but it's it's gonna make a point. That's okay. How do you read that? The next rock stars don't make sure that you don't miss Julie. Um, <clears throat> Here's, here's what I want you to understand. Visualization is important. When we get into this business, we tend to focus on things that are negative rather than the things that are positive and the things that we shouldn't be doing versus the things that we should be doing. So visualization is really important. And then I'm going to get into some of these other things. So I want to read to you something that I wrote 90 days ago, Monday. And it was 60 days before vacation. It's December 22nd, so I'm writing as in the future. We're packed and heading to the airport. Wendy, my wife, and I, we had focused on larger projects, our health. It feels good, looks good in the mirror to see the change I've made. I remember the change happened on October 21st, the day after my mastermind in California. <clears throat> I got up at 3.45 and I changed my mind, changed my course, like it happened just like that. Um, everyone else was telling me it was possible. I just needed to believe it for myself. I also refused to go back to the mastermind out of shape as I was, because I returned next week. And 
I learned to reward myself along the way by playing games for my health and reward and business by having small celebrations. That was a day that a mind shift changed 90 days ago, and I stopped drinking. And it had gotten over time, just like we do in real estate, we have things that add into our lives little by little that take us away from the things that we want. And I realized after being in California, listening to, did anybody know who uh, Tom Bilyeu is? Um, he does impact theory. If you don't, look it up on YouTube. Guy is super sharp. Um, the mastermind I'm involved in with Chris Harder. Uh, we sat at dinner with Tom Bilyeu and his wife, wife, 20 of us. Tom Bilyeu is a multi-billionaire right now. He created the Quest Protein Bar, sold it to Nestle last year for over a billion dollars. I got to hang out with this guy and listen to him and listen to his story and when it broke for him. And that weekend, there were some things that broke for me. And I realized that there was a lot of things that I had let take me away from my focus. They, they let me take away from the things I should have been doing and I was focused on the things I shouldn't be doing, which was causing a negative impact in it. So I started that journey of not drinking. So 90 days later, and, and this is where it really comes from, if you're not willing in a good market like we've had in the last couple of years to do the small, consistent things that you need to do to build your business, you will not do it when the market starts to correct itself or it starts to change. And we're starting to see some changes. Would you agree? Okay. So if you didn't make those good habits when things were good, you won't have those good habits when things start to change. So 90 days ago, there's no magic pill just like in real estate. We see it on social. It's something that we watch, we follow, and we think everybody has a magic pill on their Transformation Tuesdays, right? There are big weight changes and all these things. What they don't show you is the little things that they did day in, day out to get there. So my last 90 days, I invested in a personal trainer, and I invested in eating, like just eating right, period. So in the last 90 days, these small things, these six hours a week, that I spent in the gym, and here's the hard part. The time that I spent at night prepping my meals for the next day, like when I left today, I have my little lunch box, I have my three meals that are all measured out, that's what it looks like. So 90 days ago, and by the way, this picture here, the reason being is that the mountaintop, the terrain when you go hiking up a mountain or your Mount Everest is going to be different. It's going to change, just like the market in real estate. You know, being in the business, how many people have been in the business more than 10 years before the uh, crash? Okay. <clears throat> the terrain's changed, right? The train, the journey, the way you get to the top is different. The way you get to success is different. We need to realize that, that every time we're doing something, there's a different way to get there. Just like I found there's different ways to get there. You know, my career was with my parents originally. We were big in the investment space and property management space. Shit hit the fan in 2007. Terrain changed. How do we make it? We split our partnership. My dad did trustee sales, did very, very well with it. Um, I went into the REO space, did very well with it. And now we look at where the train shifted. When I started getting out of REO, what was my next thing? You know, my next thing is a lot of acquisitions, a lot of investors, and a lot of teaching people how to invest in real estate. So I want you to know that you know everybody has a mountain and everybody has a different path to get to the top. There's not one right way to get there but it's the small steps in an upward motion will get you to where you want to be. And if you don't take the small steps, you'll never take the big steps. This was 90 days. That was a fat ass 90 days ago. <laughs> this was yesterday at the gym with my trainer. It's funny because every day we can't see the results of the things that we're, the small things that we're doing, right? It's not until later that we see the results of the little things that we did over that time. And if we're not taking those time and we're not putting in the energy on those little things, we are not going to have the big results that we want. Because we do those little things, we see a little bit of success, and then we stop doing them for some reason. I'm not sure why that is in our business, but you do lead generation for a week, you get a couple appointments, and you forget, well, that came from over here. It came from picking up the phone. It came from the 100 no's I had to get to the two yeses that had an appointment, right? So now, fast forward to... This piece, what I want to work on today is really the little things that you can be doing on a daily basis to get you to the point of the success that you want to have. So I want to take 10 minutes, okay? This is a great way to be up part of my arm. Just kidding. This is, this is what we did at Mastermind. I really love it. 
I want you guys to take 10 minutes, 5 minutes. There's a piece of paper in front of you, and this is important. And this is why the 90 days, and this is why this is important, the 90 days. I want you to write 15 things, personal, business, kids, family, whatever it is that you think would be really cool in the next 90 days you could accomplish. And write them down. Just quickly, it doesn't have to be a big long sentence, but just write down 15 really cool kick-ass things that you want to accomplish. There's more room. Here, I got a chair right here. It'll be awkward. You can sit right in front of the class. Here comes another. Should I find some more chairs? You want the stool, man? Oh, okay. Sure. Grab a wall. Sorry, technical difficulties. We don't have any cool music to play during this. Those of you guys that are live streaming right now, just take a piece of paper out and write down the 15 things because you need to do this exercise. It's important. When you get done, two of those that are the most important things for you to do in the next 90 days. Just two. Okay, who wants to share their two things? Come on. Let me share their two things. I'll feel good. Okay, do it. I've got um, doing three to four open houses consistently every week. Okay. And um, in addition to that, the physical and uh, mental daily plan. Okay. Awesome. So 
what's important about this drill is that you now see something that's important to focus on for the next 90 days. I did this 90 days ago. I wanted to lose 35 pounds. I think I gained 10. It didn't go, but here's what I want you to see. I focused on one thing, but it was something that I didn't need to focus on. It wasn't the weight that I needed to focus on. It was the actions that I needed to focus on. And it was the result that brought it. So, you know, for your instance, if you equate that to the same thing, the open houses, the open houses are the action. But the action is kind of like getting on the scale every day going, well, shit, the weight didn't move, right? right. So it disappoints you. But you gotta focus on what is the result that you're wanting to get out of it. And so the result is the sales or the connections right. that you're doing, not necessarily the open house. The open house is the scale, the scale doesn't really squat. It's the connections and the things that you're doing. And if you do that consistently over 90 days, what do you produce at the end of that? <clears throat> so you gotta remember some weeks the scale's not gonna move, some weeks it's going to. But you have to do it consistently over that 90 days. So you have to make the goal for 90 days to, I am going to do this for the next 90 days. That's your switch. That's your flip. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm going to do it. And being consciously aware, I just had this conversation with one of my agents the other day about open houses. They said, look, you want to do an open house. What is the goal with the open house? It's not for you to go and sit there and look at your watch for the time to stop so you can go pick up your signs. How many contacts do you want to make during that time? It's three hours of lead generation time. You just happen to be sitting somewhere doing it. So you're either going to have warm bodies in or you're going to be on the phone, or you're going to do something. So I need to know what your goal is during that time frame. And every time you do one, what is the goal to do? You know, what, what is the outcome so we can measure it? So at the end of 90 days, if you actually track it, and you write about it, you know, it's something we haven't talked about yet, but you're writing about it, you're going through it, you can measure what's happening. You can see where I was at at the first open house. So I have something that I started doing this last 90 days, which is awesome. If you don't track it, you don't write it down, you have no way to measure it and see where you're at, right? So my journal every morning that I write in, which is just like this one, I write that day where I'm feeling, what I'm challenged with, what the heck is going on, you know, what monsters are in my closet, you know, what were my successes from the day before, what were the great memories? And now that I've got 90 days into it, I go back 30 days every morning and go, what happened in 30 days ago? What got resolved, what changed, what, what have I made results in? What have I not done well? But it's just it's just a one page, it's 15 minutes in the morning. At least I know where I was mentally 30 days ago. And you can start seeing changes and it's kind of fun. So, you know, I was reading this morning, you know, we were on a cruise for Christmas. So I was reading kind of the day before, the memories of my kids, where we were, where I was at with my health, like all those different things and the challenges that I was thinking about. But it's cool to see like what happened 30 days ago. Because if we all think about it, if I asked you, hey, what happened 30 days ago? Got no clue. You have no idea where you're at. So therefore, there's no way to judge where you've come from in that 30 days or that 90 days. So, you know, that that journal entry was 90 days ago when I wrote what I wanted it to be, what I wanted it to see. So if you're visualizing those open houses, what do you want to see at the end of 90 days? I want to make 20 contacts, I want to make two sales, whatever it is. But this is this is what happens. And it's a good point and a good place to do this. Every year, everybody waits to reset January 1, right? We wait. We're like, yeah, I will wait to start my eating. I will wait to start my exercise. The whole, we, we excuse ourselves to death when it comes down to it. You have to have the mindset that enough is enough. I'm going to do this and shift, period. Like, it doesn't matter when it is. It's your shift. The year doesn't have to start. I live my life 90 days at a time now. That's it. So when I got up in 90 days on Monday, guess what? It's day one. Day one, start over. It doesn't matter when it is in the year. It doesn't matter what the calendar looks like. It's day one. What do I want to accomplish in the next 90 days? Now, I've got some big badass goals, and I've got some things that I want to accomplish by the end of the year, but I have to do small steps because what happens is we make these big goals that are almost unobtainable. We don't have the steps to accomplish that big goal. It's awesome to have big goals. It's even better to have 90-day steps to get there. These are your choices right now. Stupid slideshow. You look like the guy that presented the other night where it's off the lines. Um, your choices right now. Quit. 2008, people had the choice. Quit the business, move on. Go get a job at Circle K, get out of the business because it wasn't easy anymore. 
lesson here, it's not going to be easy. It's not always easy, period. This business is hard. It's changing. We have more competition. We have more things that are happening, and we have to learn to shift with it. Or you can accept that change is constant and consistent, right? Our business is going to constantly change, and it's going to constantly be a moving target. But if you know what your target is, you start working around what it is that you can do to hit that target. <clears throat> when our clients call, and by the way, I'm gonna step in here too. Some of these things I'm gonna go through with you are very old school. This is like no brainer stuff. You know what? I'm a third generation realtor. This is the way my dad did business. This is the way I've done business. And I do it out of fun. Like I thoroughly enjoy being with my clients. We have a lot of fun. I'm a total goofball when it comes down to it. Um, it just, it's just the way I've done business and I enjoy it. And it makes me get up in the morning and wanna go do it again. Our clients call us for three reasons. One, they have a problem, right? They contact us late at night through the internet, through whatever, a phone call, a text, and it's because they have a problem. They've inherited a house. They're behind in payments. They're having financial problems. They're having health problems. They're having marital problems. They're having kid problems. You name it. They've got a problem. They're looking for advice how to solve it. Now, the problem solving is going to come in a minute when I show you the other pieces, but we need to learn to solve problems. I get paid, the bigger the problem, the more money I get paid to solve it. I don't work on commission dollars. It's just not the way I operate, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. The other reason they call is because they have a desire. They wanna relocate, they wanna move, they wanna buy a second home, they wanna move up, they wanna move down, whatever that case may be, they wanna buy a house for grandma. They've got a desire to, to accomplish something. Now your job is to guide them through that. They have a dilemma. They don't know what to do with these things. They're looking for your guidance. We are the guide to the consumer. That's what makes us different. That's what makes us better. That's what adds value over Zillow offer pad open door. They offer one solution. It's the easy button. That's all they can do. Our value is in guiding the consumer. That's what we're here for. That's why we will never lose our value as real estate agents if we continue to add value to our clients and we continue to add value to the solution, right? And I'm not just talking with your own clients, I'm talking with camaraderie, with people in this room, with Eddie, you know, Eddie is one of the first agents to reach out to me and said, hey, my client has this situation, I'm not sure exactly how to advise it, will you come meet with my client? Eddie was not afraid to reach out and say, hey, I'm unsure, can you help me? Yes, I will. I met with him and his client. He wasn't worried about me trying to steal his client. But you know what I did? I made the real estate industry look better because I was willing to go do it on both of our behalves. There may be something come out of it, may not, whatever. You know, the other thing about Eddie is Eddie's doing open houses. We flipped a house right next door to us. By the way, don't ever flip a house next door to you. <laughs> you end up eternally with neighbors and actually they're really cool people so that's a good thing Eddie um, Eddie did an open house on a flip for us for six weeks in a row and finally sold it to somebody it's a $540,000 house um, it was a great thing but he did it consistently week in, week out, week in, week out without disappointment so again, consistency <clears throat> this is what we need to be thinking about whatever somebody calls is figuring out what is it that we're looking for. We're not just looking to list or buy or, or represent when it comes down to it. We're looking to guide the consumer to a place that they want to be. <clears throat> Here's what I've learned over the last couple of years. Um, most people would look at what I do and call me nuts, crazy, whatever it is. But I love the more complicated the deal is, the more solutions I can provide, and <coughs> the more money I can, I can get paid to do it. We need to listen more and talk less and we need to ask the right questions and we need to listen for opportunity and, and here's what that looks like when we meet with somebody somebody that's in financial situation divorce they're often hiding things and we're not asking the right questions to really find what the goal is and if we don't know what the goal is we really can't get them to the end result so we have to ask better questions and truly listen to what they are saying and what they are not saying, you know, the underlying. So we have to learn that psychology of walking through that process. So, for instance, if somebody calls and says, hey, I inherited a house, and I need to sell it, my questions are not, 
well, how much do you want for it? Or what do you think you want to list it for? Or what do you think the value is? My question is, well, you know, what kind of condition is it in? Do you have the financial means to hold on to it? Do you have the financial means to fix it? Um, is there any urgency in selling the home? Do, do we need to move fast? Do we need to move slow? Um, if you can keep it, have you thought about keeping it as an investment property? All these things where I'm trying to guide the client to somewhere that maybe they didn't think about. At the end of the day, that's a particular situation that I just did. At the end of the day, his whole thing was, hey, my parents just went into a home. I need to net $35,000 to pay the bills that need to be done, and I don't have the financial means to do this. What can we do for them? Well, putting it on the market isn't really an option because they can't hold it for 60 days. They can't make the repairs, and we just bought it. Now, some of you guys aren't in that position where you're ready for stuff like that, but guess what you are in a position of? You are in a position to ask those questions, find that answer, and shoot me a text and go, hey, I got a deal. I need to close on this in seven days. You still get paid and everybody wins. This is, again, this is a solution that we forget is that not everybody is about top dollar. And this is what we have. I mean, Zillow and Open Door have proved it. Not everything is about top dollar. It's about the solution that needs to be provided. When I say opportunity, this is an opportunity not for you to take advantage of somebody. Some people get misconceived with this thing of opportunity. I'm not looking to take advantage of anybody. I'm looking to solve their problem. And again, not every consumer is looking for top dollar. They're looking for a way out. And we should be able to guide them to the way out. I have, in fact, a couple of times, just about every time I've done one of these classes, um, I've had an agent come up to me afterwards, hey, I've got this client, they've got this situation, what do I do with it? I go meet with the seller as the buyer. We put a deal together. The seller gets to stay there until they find their next house. I close on it cash. Agent gets paid. We're all moving on doing the thing. And it's a way that we can work together for the consumer that is a way to <coughs> not use a Zillow or an open door or one of these people that we're all like hate at the end of the day. And the reality is there's still a good opportunity in some cases. We've sold some stuff out of open door um, with our clients when I can't pick up where they need to be. This is something that is really important. So how many of you have, you know, especially newer agents, how many of you have been on the phone with an agent and they use the, um, do you know who I am or how many transactions I've done or, you know, they try to make you feel like a peon. Yeah. These guys get up every morning, they put the superhero cape on, and they turn into super jackass, mm -hmm. and it, it really puts a bad taste in our mouths when it comes down to it. So I would ask you when you do this, stop playing hero. It's not our story. It's the customer's story. It's your story. It's your buyer's story. If I'm representing a listing, it's you and your buyer. It's your story. I'm only there to guide the best way I can for my client or myself when I'm selling the house on my own. We need to really look at guiding the consumer through all the noise in the business right now and really know all their options. If we've only been taught one way to do business, which is typical in the industry right now because we don't think outside the box. See, I was taught to think outside the box because I'm third generation. My dad lived through 18% interest rates. My dad lived through all those markets. I've seen the ups and downs. And you start thinking like, how do I get outside this to make this happen? And that's how we guide the consumer. So you really need to be very aware that there's other options and there's other people, people that you're sitting right next to that you can talk to about, hey, what do you think about this? Where can I take this? What does it look like? And reach out to those people to see, like I get text messages all the time, hey, I got this seller, this is what it looks like. Can you do anything with it or do you know anybody? I love that because you know what? I'm helping another agent, another partner, provide a solution for a client that then again, it bolsters our industry and who we are, rather than what the public perceives us as, which is used car salesmen. Either one step or one, one step above or one step below, depending on the survey. I'm all about service. Everything's about service and experience. This should be something that you're critically thinking about. It's not how can I help you, <clears throat> or it's how can I help you, not how can I sell you. When I first got into the business, it was all about selling. It was 
It was about getting that paperwork signed. It was about that six-month listing. It was about all that stuff. I've thrown all that away. In fact, I don't even have a listing presentation anymore. I just don't. Because I'm going to go there. I'm going to go through the questions that I have. I'm going to do a 30-day listing and go, hey, you know what? Either you want to work with me or you don't. Period. I'm not going to lock somebody in for six months that I have to battle with to get something done. It's not worth my time. I'll move on to something else. But I do want to guide them and I want to serve them if they will let me. If they think they know better than me, I, you can have it. I've got a referral for you. I don't like that. Uh, it's their story. We have to help them write their story and get where they want to be. See, we tend to, if you look at social media, it's, look, I sold another house. I listed a house. I, I, I. And there's no what you did for the consumer. There's no story. I mean, what's the best testimonial? It's when the consumer takes a picture of the post and says, my agent did all these things and guided us to X. It comes differently when you're trying to tell the story of how great you were rather than how you got them from point A to point B, right? It changes the referral, it changes the source, and it changes the story. We have um, in our office, which I love because people question it, we have a story wall in our office. And so there's a bunch of canvas pictures of selfies with our agents, our clients, people in the office, people out of the office, and there's a story behind every one of those pictures. So when a client's in the conference room waiting, they can pick up those pictures and read the story. It has nothing to do with what we did, it's where they got to and how they got there. And so it's kind of an interesting thing when you start really looking at how you're helping people rather than selling. And I can assure you, the more you help somebody, the more they're going to refer, the more they're going to appreciate you, and you are going to build a greater trust when it comes down to your business. We talked a little bit about the 90 days. I'm going to tell you something that it's very near and dear to me when it comes down to story in this business. You have to focus on you first. And I told you about my health journey because I show up better, I show up clearer, I show up better for my clients, better for my family, better for my kids now. That was something that was something that was that I needed to do for me, that I needed to work on myself. In the last 90 days, I focused on myself. Not that I let my business go, but it was a sheer focus on that. Let me give you the, the reverse of what happens. When you don't focus on yourself, you let your clients drag you around, you let people steal time from you, and ultimately you pay the price like my dad did. My dad died four years ago, terminal cancer. My dad worked the last five years of his life for one particular investor. The guy was an ample, because I got stuck with him after my dad died for about nine months until I let him go. The guy bought 400 homes from my dad at trustee sale. But the guy used my dad over and over again, and my dad sold his services, his creativity, and the 40 years he put in the business for pennies on the dollar because my dad decided he was gonna be dependent on this one client. My dad let his health go. He let everything go to drive for this guy. You know what happened? Nine months after, or a couple months after my dad passed, my mom's left as a property management company, I split the sales up, and he pretty much just left. After he promised, you know, good Christian guy, you know, not that I have anything against Christianity, because I am one, but good Christian guy, always saying the right things, always promised my dad that selling all these homes would be his retirement. Promised my parents that. My dad would reduce his fees so he'd get to where he was. The guy's portfolio is worth five times what it was when my dad sold it for him or purchased it for him, and the guy just left. And the guy never was true to his promise to my family. And that was when my shifted. Look, I love serving clients. But I can tell you that I put the oxygen mask on myself just like the airlines before I put it on somebody else. Because ultimately it's up to us to take care of us. And we serve and we get paid for doing those things. But guess what? You are a client of yourself as well. That was, that was the thing I realized. You know what? I'm going to be just as much of a client. It always cracked me up when my dad and I would get into it. We always butted heads about things. So my dad would find a great deal. My dad bought 800 homes dur during the, the downtime at trustee sale. My dad would have bought one home every 10 he sold for himself. 
My mom's life would look a little different right now, do you think? Because of the investment opportunities. And by the way, back then you could buy a $50,000 home at 18% interest and still cash flow. It would still be good. The house would be worth 200 now, a little different. But it's if we're not doing those things and we're not thinking about it, we tend to focus on our clients, but we rarely focus on ourselves and what our futures look like. And again, if you're not willing to do the small things day to day, you won't be ready to do those things in a changing market. Value. Here's something in a word that I want you to put in use. And it's something that I took away from Cole Hatter. Do any of you know who Cole Hatter is? Um, he's a real estate investor, um, does an event called Thrive every year in Vegas. Guy is a wordsmith genius in the psychology department. And when you listen to this guy at the mastermind, you're like, this guy could sell anything for anybody. But I started realizing something and I started talking to people and I'm gonna give you a couple of great examples to throw into your listings, your buyer's appointments. When you pay a fee for something, it causes negativity, correct? The bank charges you a late fee, you pay to park your car, you know, all these things, it's all negative, right? I started doing my listing appointments and explaining, well, why do you charge 7%? Well, I don't charge 7%, this is what it looks like. I'm gonna ask you to invest 4% into selling your home through me. Because of my experiences, my connections, my relationships, how we do things, how we negotiate. I want you to invest in me to sell your home, okay? You're gonna pay a fee for the buyer's agent to bring a buyer, but you're investing in me, which is different than what, I'm, what you think I'm charging you, because I'm not charging you anything. I'm asking you to invest in a professional to sell your home and guide you through the process. It changes the conversation when you look at that. It changes, which I love the conversation with the buyer, so this one thing should enable you to um, work on your buyer brokers. It's actually a lot of fun and it's super easy conversation. When I sit down with our buyers and we have consults, I simply ask, I simply tell them, hey, by the way, you may have some misconceived notions of how I get paid in this transaction. So I'll let you know that you're investing three and a half percent of the purchase price into my representation of you. The good news is, is the seller's gonna contribute two and a half to three percent towards that investment for me to represent you. You're gonna be on the hook for the other, but I'm gonna to try to negotiate that into the contract, but whatever I can't get negotiated, you will, you'll have to pay the difference. And it's amazing how that conversation is, okay, no problem. You know, this is my commitment, this is what I'm doing, this is how we're doing it. And a little tidbit on that is that, how many of you guys realize that when you put 3% on line 100 in the contract, it is designated for certain costs you can't throw a bunch of other stuff in there to get reimbursed, and a lot of times the seller gets an extra thousand or fifteen hundred bucks because we didn't utilize all of it because it's designated specifically for title and lender costs. You change in additional terms that the buyer can use the contribution on line 100 to any and all costs associated with the purchase of the home, including inspections, appraisals, buyer broker, those pieces. You now have the option, if there's money left on the table, to submit those things and get all of that 3% back. So this is a way that we've worked through. It's also a way that we cover some of our buyer broker agreements. Um, it's a way to, if you think about it, if you do 25 transactions with buyers and you can add $1,000 per transaction, it's an extra 25 grand this year. It's the little things. What are you doing with the counter on, on that? Because I counted on that. On what? On the 3%? On um, everything you did. I, I, We'll find another house. <laughs> it, it depends, you know. Um, it depends, you know what? I mean, you're talking about that, but is that really the best thing for the seller? Because the question is, are the numbers working out in everybody's favor at well, the end of the day? The first thing I asked when they asked for extra money, in which we didn't know they were going to use it for that, we took a lot of our we usually buy points to buy the home. That's the question I asked. And if they don't use the points to buy the home, then we put a Everybody, everybody has their ways of negotiating. You know, when we when we sell our flips, you know, I've already budgeted for three percent towards buyer's closing costs because I know what it's like to be on the other end and try to fight for that three percent with the other. But I'm working with investors too. They look, they look out for that. Sure, but again, 
that that's that's conversation setting out the expectation. Mm -hmm. I work with investors too, mm -hmm. and when we sell their homes, when we work with our sellers, every one of them is budgeted for a ten to eleven percent cost of sale, mm -hmm. because I don't want to fight with them when I get a contract. They've already been set up the expectations. Hey, if I can sell your house with all these numbers in it, are you good with this net price? I set it up from the beginning. I set it up with clear expectations so that it's not this constant battle when it gets there over a thousand bucks or whatever. It's going back to the conversation saying, hey, we had this conversation. It meets exactly the numbers. Let's go here. Let's not muck the waters when it comes down to it. But again, you're doing a great job for your clients. I mean, going back to that, depending on what side of the pit you're on, I always ask everybody, hey, you know what? It goes back to the golden rule. You know, you want to bombard agents, you're the one that gets it on the other end. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of these businesses that when it comes down to relationships, mm -hmm. trust me, I had my early days when I was a total jerk to certain agents and things, and I realized a while ago that I'm gonna run into one of these people and they're either mm -hmm. gonna save me or they're gonna crush me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important in the business that we realize that you're gonna run across somebody again. And trust me, there's a fair share of agents, they probably won't be able to buy one of my houses, especially the one that I own, uh, because of past transactions. So keep that in mind, you know, when your reputation comes down back. <clears throat> in order for us to contend, compete, and be successful in this industry, would you all say that we're contending against, you know, commission compression, all these things that are coming down on us. The easy way to sell Zillow, you got people like me that'll make it super easy and sell it with no fees. We have to provide value and we have to be able to show our value and that's where the guiding and leading people through the process is, okay? I'm not talking about big marketing plans and all this other stuff like we used to do. My dad used to have this listing book that was three inches thick and in fact, he used to read it almost line for line in listing presentations, and one night he fell asleep reading it to a client who was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to find your groove. You have to find what works for you, what you're comfortable with, and everybody has a different way of doing it. Um, but we have to add value. And, and the value is your expertise and your guidance through the noise. So just keep that in mind that, that we are valuable, and they are investing in somebody to guide them through the process. They are not paying somebody to Okay, this is where I'm really big on. <clears throat> Back to my dad's story. 750 homes, knew everything about that time. I was still in the REO business, I was still digging out of debt. I wished I would have bought one out of 20 of the Fannie Mae properties I listed for 50 grand. My position would be a lot better now too. I was too busy paying off the million dollars in the debt that we created. <clears throat> but here's what I refused to do four years ago. I refused to not just sit around and go, well, I don't have the money, I don't have the means to invest in real estate. I started getting super creative. I started thinking about things. I started looking at the wholesales and the things that were coming across my desk. You are investors. Every one of you is an investor in real estate. It's something you know. It's something you love. It's something that is you're passionate about. And it's something you should be involved in. So I got this rude awakening this week, believe it or not. <clears throat> How many of you know that on your taxes, we get, thank, thank you to the IRS for this break, because you have a real estate license, did you know that you have a huge tax break when you own rental properties? Because you're in the industry. <coughs> Over the last four years, we went from zero to $10 million in rental properties with none of our own money. And this year, it actually saved us $100,000 in taxable income from the properties that we own. So it was, it was a realistic $50,000 check. So not only do we have the houses being paid down, the deals that we bought, the appreciation that we have, and all those things happening, it also wrote me a check for 50 grand this year. You gotta start with the little things. So the little things, and one of the things that I teach is the buy box. And believe it or not, so how many people in here own investment properties? Okay, handful of you. There's a lot of things out there when it comes down to investing that we are unaware of in the real estate business. I'm a little bit more privy to it, so my mom owns a property management company, I own a lot of rental properties, and I work with a lot of investors. We've done something based on data called the buy box. The buy box is a geographical area that you're comfortable with, 
It's a size of house, whether it's multi-level, single level, pools, no pools, HOAs, all these data points that we put together that makes the ideal long-term hold. Because it's amazing when you do the numbers on a 20 or 30 year hold with something with a $50 HOA fee that you just paid $25,000 over the lifetime of the property that didn't give you anything. Do that times 30. And let me know how your investment turns out at the end of the day. So, you know, when you're investing, you need to look at it and see how can I invest? What does it look like? Where does, where does it fit in? And if you know it, again, you're the client. You are a client, you're an investor. So if you know what you're looking for, when it comes up from a Zillow lead, it comes up from a seller, remember that house is gonna pay you once if you sell it. It's gonna pay you for 30 years if you buy it as an investment. I bought several of our clients' homes that come off of Zillow, those types of things, because they didn't necessarily wanna put it in the market. And keep in mind, if they're gonna sell it and there's 10% cost of sale roughly, you're already halfway there to a down payment. So there's, there's a number of creative ways, but you have to really get into that groove of, I want to buy a rental property, how do I do it? What does it look like? And believe it or not, you know when I, when I started the Limitless course, teaching people and going through it, um, there's creative financing to get you from, you know we have $10 million worth of properties and we have about $150,000 of our own money in that $10 million. That's it, I don't have 20% down to the property. It's been through creatively looking through things. Um, Julie's going through her first, her, or her second. Um, Julie took the course last time, and she's going through her second round on, I'm gonna buy it, do this crazy financing, and then refinance it and have nothing into it repaired and everything. And so we have to look at those things because <clears throat> there was nobody that was teaching this stuff when the market started to hit. There was nobody saying, hey, don't be worried about this. Don't bury your head in the sand. This is opportunity. You know, and the other thing too that is, is really big on this right now, the rental market is ridiculous right now. Um, we just rented a 2-2, no garage, no pool at 39th Avenue in Glendale for $14.50 a month. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I rented a core two in Buckeye for sixteen fifty a month. Right. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, we're back into the 200 225 price range with twenty percent down. That's cash flow. Wow. One of the reasons is if you really want to track through this and why, and this is another thing. Not only are you an investor, but you guys all have databases. I chose not to let investors come in that have some sort of you know, background in investing, I teach people how to invest because I want them to invest based on how I do it because I don't need to be told how to do it. And what that's done is it's allowed me to take people through a wealth building process of a long-term plan to build some rentals. So you're asking people, hey, if in 20 years you had $5,000 worth of passive income and a million dollars worth of free and clear properties, does that sound appealing? Well, yeah, well, how do I do that? Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna go through the process. So I have a process that I take people through to get them interested in investing. You know, it's um, it's something that a lot of us don't do because we just don't know it because we haven't done it ourselves. <clears throat> um, the reason the rental market, this is kind of interesting. I went through it with somebody the other day. I'm gonna do them on time. Okay. Um, I didn't think I was gonna be able to get through an hour. <laughs> um, early 2000. There was not a lot of people investing in real estate, single family homes. It was very minimal. Even though part of the reason was because rates were about seven to eight percent. I know because I bought my first home in 99 for eight percent interest. So those, those of us that have clients that are whining about five. Um, so at that time, there wasn't a lot of rental. People were more buying because prices were lower, those types of things. Fast forward to 2004, Everybody, including their dog, their cat, and their goldfish, had rental properties. And it was really cool in 2007 to talk about how many homes you were short selling. And so what's happened is, is all those people, those were all rentals, right? Well, now all those people are getting kicked out of their rental because it got foreclosed on. And now you have the super smart vultures that came in and bought everything in our market. Well, now those people, what you have not seen, which caused the market, the rental market to drop. 
you know, the average rent in 2009 was like 850 bucks because there were so many things available. Um, I remember my dad doing something, I'm like, what? They were giving free TVs away with a year lease. Like, that's how they were getting things rented. Um, and back then, a flat screen TV was still a thousand bucks. So now you look at it, and over the last five years, what we haven't seen or equated is that all those vultures have quietly exited one house at a time. They just started to vanish. So what happens? We don't have the rental inventory we used to. So the prices are higher. The rental inventory is lower, and it's causing us. I mean, I haven't had anything in one of my rentals, you know, go vacant for more than two weeks over the last couple of years. We've gotten top dollar for those, and so you start looking at. There's going to be more and more of that, and more need for the rentals as we have an amazing economy. We have a lot of job growth. We have a lot of different things going on here. So, investing in real estate here is still a really good thing. Okay. This is important, but it's not as important as this. Leads lead to relationships, but if you're not cultivating the relationship with the leads, then there's no point in getting leads. Okay, like I said earlier, um, this is interesting. So this is Miss Joanne that I'm dancing with on my 40th birthday last year. Her husband and I, well, they met me when I was six. They were friends of my uh, family when we first moved to Phoenix. Her husband was pretty higher up in uh, APS for 40 years. I think he started with APS when they were selling gas lines, digging ditches. That's how long he was there. <clears throat> when my dad died, I originally started. John was a great mentor of mine. And I started playing racquetball with him on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We've been playing for eight years now. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I don't miss those meetings. And we have coffee every time afterwards. I've never sold John a house. In fact, they lived in the same house since I was six. So it's kind of funny when it comes down to it. He's never referred me to anybody. That relationship though, John early on, when I first wanted to start flipping and buying rentals, I had no idea what kind of cash John was sitting on. As we started talking and getting more into it, John loved me and loved our relationships and he was willing to invest in me. There's people that you guys have in your databases and in your circles that have money that are willing to invest in you that are constantly looking for things to invest in that they believe in. And your relationships are the key to you building your wealth and giving you opportunity down the road. There are also the things that are gonna create referrals, but those relationships have to be worked on. They're not something, you know, why do people call Zillow and OfferPad that were past clients? Because you didn't maintain the relationship. There was, and I'm not talking about throwing postcards out here and there, I'm talking about a relationship, people that you cherished. Um, John and Joanne over the last six years have invested you know, over and over again. I continually have about $2 million of their money at play. And it's because of relationship, nothing else. So all of us have that option to work with the relationships that we have and cultivate those to enhance the business that we have. And John started out, you know, some of you have thought about flipping, thought about rentals. John started out as a partner. Eventually he turned into a lender, but early on, I partnered with a lot of people with money to do flips. They put all the money in, I did all the work. By the way, I don't do any work on the houses, I'm terrible at it, my wife does. Um, the tile will be crooked, the walls will definitely be out of square. So, at the end of this, this is the question. Are you gonna quit, or are you gonna quit making excuses? Are you gonna find the things that you can do and focus on? You look at that list and go, in the next 90 days, I'm going to accomplish these things. And don't make the list long. That's why I ask you to start two things. Find the things you want to focus on in the next 90 days, and then at the end of the 90 days, reset. And I say that because life changes, business changes, and guess what? The market may change a little bit over that 90 days, and it gives you the chance to reset what the next step is. And that's what's important. That's how I operate my team. That's how we operate our business. That's how we operate our life goals. 90 days. Because it's easy to get through 90 days. It's hard to look at, I want to lose 40 pounds on January 1, and by January 24, you're like, screw this, I've lost three, it's too much work. So, but if you focused in the first quarter and said, I want to lose 10 pounds, and it's two pounds a week, or one pound a week over 12 weeks, not a big deal. It's easier to accomplish. Write everything down. Even if it's a daily brain dump, write it down so you can revisit it. This is where I'm at. Love for you guys to follow me and connect with me. 
Um, I do this out of passion to make people better in the business, to get people to not, I don't ever want to see another agent do what my dad did. My dad worked 40 years in the business to end up owning one home at the end of four years. That was it. All his genius, all the things that he did, all the things he accomplished, and all the things he accomplished for others he never did for himself. And you guys need to learn to work on yourself as much as you're working on your clients. I still believe in servicing my clients, so don't get me wrong. But I do believe that we miss opportunities in the business to increase our wealth, increase our net worth, and those should all be goals every year. And again, we have the ability for the tax breaks and all the different things that we have that we don't take advantage of. You know, I look at my dad going back to him. If he owned 40 properties and had the tax breaks and the things, what would it look like? You know, and, and I look at our stuff. I mean, my goal is 50 by 50, which is 50 free and clear properties by the age of 50. I have 10 years to go. You got another 18 properties to go. But we're still every day. But it's something that when I look at age 50, I go, well, $60,000 a month in residual income, plus 10 plus million dollars worth of free and clear properties. That was over time. I didn't have to put a bunch of money into that. You know, that's the great thing about real estate. It's the only thing we can leverage to invest in that somebody else pays back over time. And we forget all that in the industry. I'm not sure why, but I think part of it is, is just, it's not widely taught and we don't see all the advantages of it because we think it's a cost, we think tenants are paying them up, those types of things. They really aren't when you look at it. So guys, I'm Steve Valentine. I hope that was useful information. So about the 24th of the year and uh, hopefully it pushes you that by April 31st, you've accomplished those two things with your next 90 days. Thank you.